students and faculty uh, and his advisors and uh, uh, on this topic. It is fascinating and has a lot of implications on social media. Uh, Jonathan's worked very, very hard on this, I know. Uh, I've had the pleasure of having him as a student in the non-math areas and he's equally uh, gifted in both. And uh, it's our loss out of management for you, right? <laughs> and, but you will be a great leader, uh, I know, in the future. Uh, without further ado, Jonathan, take over. It's your show. Thank you, Professor Sugovis. Uh, so my name is John Skaza. Uh, this is my senior capstone presentation. Hopefully everyone's in the right place. <laughs> so I'm, I'm talking, uh, I'm going to give a talk on the project titled Mathematical Modeling of Trending Topics on Twitter. Kind of a mouthful. Previous title that you may have seen was actually a bit more confusing, but <laughs> I, um, pretty much what it is. Uh, so let's jump right into some uh, graphs. It, it is um, kind of mathy and technical. Okay, so this is just kind of a um, intro plot to get you thinking about this topic. And these are three different hashtags. I'll get into the details of Twitter and exactly what it is and how it works in a few moments. But just look at these for now as three different topics. And of course, on the x-axis, we have time in minutes. And on the y-axis, we have uh, tweet count. So obviously, the higher up means it's trending. More people are talking about it. And it's kind of compli uh, a bit more complicated than it may seem in terms of how I get this graph. Because each point actually represents how many tweets there were about that topic in the past 200, um, yeah, 200 seconds for one. And some of them are different. The bins are different depending on the topic. Just so we can get the nice looking curves uh, for each topic. Because some obviously take longer to work up and work back down. So binning it helps kind of uh, make it look a little nicer and will help us in modeling um, these topics later on. So you can see um, in this in this presentation, I'd like to I'll talk about the objectives in a moment. Um, how we quantify this sort of, this sort of phenomenon, and as you'll see, you can use things that we also use in studying diseases um, and how they spread over time. Very similar uh, <coughs> models. But then I also wanted to consider things about what, how certain topics differ from one another. You see, one's a TV show, one's a CWC is actually the Cricket World Cup, um, that's, that's a sporting event, and one's a political um, message. So that is kind of a quick primer on what, I'm, what my motivation is and what I'm interested in. <coughs> so the uh, specific objectives that I wanted to look at, as I said, I wanted to assign a number to that sort of phenomenon, or numbers, um, in terms of how different hashtags um, spread over time and how they die back down over time. <coughs> I'd like to compare and contrast different trending topics, so different areas, politics, sports, and television or entertainment, as I, as I showed on the first slide. Um, in, kind of the interesting thing is comparing these dynamics, the social media dynamics, to the dynamics that we see in infectious diseases like the flu. I'll show an example of how the same models that I used um, can be applied to the spread of last year's flu season. Um, actually, the models were intended to be for the flu season, but I used them for a different purpose. And then uh, I wanted to create a reproducible output product in terms of uh, allowing other people to do similar things and build on the work that I've done. Because um, it's really neat and obviously there are always new tweets coming in and things like that so that people can build off what I've done and uh, implement their own things and model their own hashtags or whatever it may be. Uh, so in this project there will be some conclusions about different topics and whatnot, but really I look at it as I've, I've developed more of a tool set that can be used to analyze, um, or a toolkit that can be used to analyze uh, trending topics on Twitter. Um, so the agenda, I'll do a brief overview of Twitter because that's the boring thing. I want to get into the technical part. And uh, so then I'll get into the method methodology that I use in my study. I'll look at some previous studies that use this uh, similar sort of strategy. And then I would like to look at um, results and discussion of what, basically what I actually did. And then there'll be some Q&A at the end, but if you really want to interrupt me, throw it away. I don't really mind. Uh, so about Twitter, you've probably all heard of it. It was created in 2006, so it's almost a decade old, I guess. Um, incorporated, it, obviously it's a huge company, multinational company now, and it gained corporation status in 2007. There are almost 300 million monthly active users, so that means people who actually tweet at least once a month. And we see uh, these users put out about 500 million tweets per day, 
and you can look up more of these fun facts at the Twitter website itself. This is an anatomy of a sample tweet. Here we go, this is me saying some, <laughs> something prophetic. <laughs> um, so this is me, yeah, this is about March Madness, it's pretty, uh, a few weeks ago. So you see I say something uh, that's on my mind, I can say whatever I want, and then people have the opportunity to retweet it, uh, spread it to their people who follow them, and then um, you can favorite it if you like. I guess no one favorited this. <laughs> uh, but then we have March. Uh, this this is the hashtag. So this would be something that I I would that you saw in the first plot. This would be something that I'm interested in because this is how we identify what people are talking about. So in this case, I was talking about March Madness, and clearly people can um, or researchers can tell that because I'm able to access what through Twitter what what. Um, the topic was based on this hashtag symbol. All you have to do is put in this number character, this number sign, and then it will, Twitter will uh, classify that as a March Madness tweet. Um, so this is more into the how I get this data. So we clearly see that this is the hashtag that I'm talking about in this case, but how does a researcher pull and sort through all these hashtags on Twitter and get into something that I can use during uh, in my research? So there, Twitter is very good because it's public um, Public, anyone can look at Twitter unless it's a private account. Um, but all the information is public, and I'm able to access what's called the Twitter API, which is often used to develop apps, but I used it for research purposes by writing a, a script that allows me to connect, uh, connect to a, a streaming API. So basically what happens is I, I write this script and I put in all the credentials that I need and I'm able to connect to Twitter. And as in real time, because of the streaming API that I use, Twitter will essentially uh, push the tweets that are coming in to my computer, um, and I can store that all in a text file and do what I want with it from there. Um, so basically what, what happens is, um, when, I, when I establish this connection with Twitter, I have to tell it exactly what I want. And, and again, it's not I won't get everything from Twitter, but I'll get a decent sample of it. Because obviously if I, everything would blow up in my computer, but you get like, you get like 1% or whatnot, and, um, you, you tell Twitter, this is really how I get exactly what I want. You tell Twitter what you, um, what you care about, really. So I, I want tweets in English so that I can interpret them in my study. I want, uh, that's basically all I cared about, and, and this track um, option. So I wanted to, tr what I did in, towards, since I'm um, concerned about trending topics and I wanted to use hashtags as a proxy for trending topics, I wanted to use this, I only care about tweets that included this hash character in there. Because if they include this hash character in there, then I know that there's a hashtag in there, and so that from there I can pull up the topic that I want to talk about. So I'm going to get a bunch of hashtags with different topics, and then I can kind of group them together so I, just, I can look at one topic at a time. And all these other things are just options that you could use if you really wanted to do something different with the data. So this is one tweet that we got. Uh, this is all the information that you get, uh, all these things on the previous slide, you can see all of that in there. So this is before it's filtered. Um, so really, what I'll, all I care about, the time that it came in, because I'm looking at the spread of information over time. And then somewhere down here, there's something that says hashtag, hashtags. <laughs> um, so and the, this is a sample tweet. Again, it's about March Madness. I, it's not random pick that chose this one. So it's NCAA and March Madness were the two hashtags in this one. <coughs> So from all this junk, all I care about for my study is the hashtag and the time that it came in. So we write a, Professor Blaze helps me write a script to get rid of all that and pick out everything that I want for all the tweets coming in, and I get this. Um, so I, this is exactly what I want, the time that it came in and the two topics that are being talked about in that tweet, and I can work from there. Okay, so the methodology that I use once I get all this um, data that I want, data collection is, and sampling Twitter and getting the sample that I need is actually probably the majority of the work that I did. Um, and, and maybe the identifying topics that I want to talk about. And then from here, the tools are kind of already in place to uh, move forward with that. So like I said, a lot of the outcome of this project is tools that can be reused in the future for different studies, rather than like a definitive result. <laughs> and I plan to use these sort of things in the future as well. So I have my sample of Twitter and I get in all this data with the nice clean form that I want. Now the next thing to do is that I have to identify these topics that may be trending 
Because obviously I'm getting data on all the hashtags, and I just want to pick out ones that follow that nice um, trending shape, um, rather than something like iPhone is one that I saw all the time coming in, and it's just constant over time. People are always talking about iPhone, rather than something like um, the Cricket World Cup that's obviously not going on year-round all the time. So that's really something that you can see as being trending. So I cr created a nice um, diagram, or a nice kind of interactive widget that I can sort through everything and kind of look for these different um, these different topics and which ones are good to model. And then, so from there, I actually use the model to or use modeling strategies, which I'm obviously going to talk about a bit more. And then I'm going to analyze the results. And once I get the results on how these topics trend, and we can quantify how these topics trend, I like to compare the different hashtags to one another, so different topics. I want to look at prediction in, in terms of if I have some data on one trending topic, but maybe it's not done trending yet, can I predict the rest of that path that it, that it will follow? And also, like I said, since these methods are often used in disease, <coughs> I compare the two um, different dynamics. Okay, so this is the disease this is the model that, again, originated, as I said a few times, originated in mapping infectious disease in kind of an epidemiolo epidemiological um, context. So we have this, so basically how these models work, I'll start with the infectious disease. Uh, you have to classify the population into three different categories in terms of this basic SIR model. There are other extensions of this, but this is a good one to start with. So you classify everyone in the population that you're studying as either susceptible, which means they're able to um, catch, the, uh, catch the disease. So say, let's say we're studying the flu. So you're able to study the flu, maybe you're, and this is kind of a real world example, maybe you're proximal to somebody who's infected with the flu already, so therefore you're susceptible and able to catch the flu. And then once you catch the flu, you become in this infected category of the population. So now you're infected, obviously, so um, you're, in the, you're in the infected category. And then once you're infected, after some time, you transition into the recovered category, which means you're over the disease and um, you recover and you can move on. But um, other models, like there's a, there's a similar model called SIS, so in, the, in that case, you'd have a disease where you're susceptible, you become infected with that disease, but once you recover, you're actually susceptible again, so there's no really immunity to that disease. So you can go back, so you can play around with these models um, a bunch. So applying, you can apply this similar methodology to Twitter. So you're susceptible uh, to receiving a hashtag or receiving a message on Twitter if you're, if you're a Twitter user, because if you're a, a Twitter user, you can see all these tweets coming in since they're public information. Um, you be, I, I say that you become infected with a tweet or a topic if you view this topic and you send out a message about it. So you kind of you're kind of infected by it in a sense, meaning that um, you saw a message and you reacted to it by by tweeting. And then this is kind of hard to uh, um, explain, but if you recover from a tweet, I can basically just move on to something. It's kind of hard. To, to kind of uh, compare that to a disease, but obviously uh, you can still use capture the dynamics by categorizing people in these categories. So this is the actual mathematics behind this model. You don't really, you don't literally just pick out people and put them into a bin. You have to you have to look at transition rates between the bin uh, between the bins. So I think it's I think it's pretty intuitive um, how you move from one bin to another. So say you're in the susceptible bin, you're on Twitter. And then you become infected. The rate that it, so this right here is the rate at which people become infected. So you can call that the infection rate. Um, that's basically all beta is. And then gamma is going from infected to recovered, and that is just the recovery rate. So th those are the, essentially the two rates that I'm interested in looking at and seeing if these rates differ between topics. So this is really how I can compare topics. If the infection rate is different between topics, and if the recovery rate is different between topics. Um, so these are the this is the system of differential equations that model uh, that um, correspond to this um, this compartmental model. And again, I think it's I think it's pretty intuitive. Um, so 
you can obviously derive this, but just from a um, practical viewpoint, think of um, the number of susceptible depends on how many people are getting infected and moving into that class. And the number of people getting infected depends on how many people are susceptible to get infected and how many people are infected that can give them this disease or tweet about this topic. Um, so that's how people, and, and obviously it's a negative sign there because people are moving out of this susceptible class into the infected class. Um, now, the same, um, the same, the same um, ex expression is moving into this infected class because they're leaving susceptible and going into infected. But also we have those recovering from the infected class <coughs> moving into the recovery class. So I think it makes a, a lot of sense if you just think it through a little bit. And then, so it's easy enough to uh, outline how this model works, but then to estimate these parameters kind of takes a little work. I use what's called um, MCMC simulation techniques uh, based on the, d the data that I gathered. We only have data on infected people uh, since I only have tweets and time. I don't have anything about susceptible or recovered, so I kind of have to simulate to estimate these parameters and estimate how many people are susceptible at a given time and recovered at a given time. Um, <coughs> before I get into how I um, uh, my, my methodology and my application of these uh, methods, I like to look at some previous studies that use very similar techniques. Um, so like I said, a lot of this, since it was created about, SIR model was created about 90 years ago, there have been a lot of applications in, S, um, in infectious disease. So a lot of studies dealing with measles, uh, many with influenza, as uh, I actually have an example of that later in this talk. And then other applications. Like I said, it's not these models aren't just u uh, useful in modeling infectious disease. They can be used in things like information spread or uh, spread of an idea um, and things like that. So this right here is actually a spread of an idea. It's a physics term, Feynman diagram. And they, the authors used, uh, let's call it, S-E-I-Z. So I used S-I-R models. They used S-E-I-Z models, which is the same exact idea of compartmentalizing people into these different groups and looking at transition rates between the groups. But there's just difference because it was an idea. So it was, uh, they had like a skeptical group, people ignoring the idea and things like that. Uh, news and rumors on Twitter, which is very close to what I'm doing. Um, but they use slightly different methodology in terms of um, how they get the results. Uh, spread of rumors and social networks, again, a very similar concept, but again, not directly applied to Twitter because I want to be doing something kind of new and uh, to contribute to the existing literature. And then Professor Blaze <laughs> used these as methods as kind of a teaching example and to model a zombie apocalypse. And, and um, so he classified people, or he used movie examples and looked at the spread of zombies, zombie population over time. And he talked about the flu in the paper too. <laughs> and zombies don't use Twitter, I don't think. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> okay. So now let's get into the actually applying these um, these methods <coughs> to so, the data that I collected. So this is uh, run through like a full example with this Obama date, this Obama hashtag. Um, I think it's something we could all relate to. It's a political rather than picking some random hashtag. This one seemed like a good one to use. And so this is again the spread of the Obama hashtag over time. So it was either I forget it was 900 second or 1,000 second bins. So each point represents the tweet count in the past, say, a thousand seconds. Um, so you can see that uh, almost 45 minutes into the beginning of this trending topic, um, it's really reached as a peak of how many people are talking about it on Twitter, and then dies back down slowly over time. And this all happens in about 200 minutes. And again, we'll see with infectious disease like the flu, this same exact process will happen on a scale of months five months or something like the flu season. Um, so, yeah. so now we have the data and we see how it works and kind of what it looks like. <coughs> now we want to be able to quantify this, this phenomenon. So I use a Bayesian technique to, before running these MCMC methods. So basically what I have to say is some of it's trial and error, some of it's previous knowledge from other things that I've done or other models that I've run. Um, so what I say is, beta, the parameters that I talked about were beta and gamma, the infection rate and the recovery rate. So I'm saying, based on what I know and kind of some work that I've done, the, 
the beta parameter likely falls between zero and two. I don't have any more knowledge than that, so I'll specify it as a uniform prior, meaning um, it's, it's likely, just as likely it could be anywhere. I think it could be anywhere in that range before I actually run the simulation. Same for gamma. So these are actually what we call um, uninformative priors, where um, I, it's kind of more objective approach, I'd say, where you, you don't necessarily specify where exactly you think it is or what the initial, the, the prior distribution looks like, you say that it could just be anywhere in this range, zero to two. We do the same thing for um, the initial susceptible, as zero is how many people are susceptible. We don't have data on that. And I can also fit the initial infected. You see the in initial infected on the data is like one. Um, but when we fit the model, the model may not necessarily go start here, so I can fit the initial eye. Maybe it's better fit if I started there. So I say it's probably between 0 and 10. There's no way it's going to be more than 10, the initial infected. So now I run this. So now I can run the simulation. So I run this simulation. Uh, this is just for one of the parameters. So this is the beta parameter. I run the simulation, and this is the code that does just that. Pretty straightforward. So I specify the uniform prior between 0 and 2. Then I run the simulation 10,000 times. And then this is the plot of the results of this simulation. So you can see, um, after 10,000 runs, it, the, the MCMC converges to about 0.5. So that's essentially our best estimate for the beta parameter. But certainly there's some uncertainty. Um, certainly there's some uncertainty. <laughs> so there is also some uncertainty there. Um, uh, so we can look at that in the posterior distribution. So we're not going to say it's the best parameter is 0.5. We'll say it's probably the best estimate is 0.5, but there's also um, probability that it could be somewhere else. So, to, so I draw from this posterior probability distribution after the simulation that I ran. Again, our best estimate was about 0.5 for that case, um, but again, there's some uncertainty. So and that, that was just for the beta parameter, remember. We do the same thing for the gamma parameter, the initial S and the initial I, and we can get posterior probability distributions for those uh, parameters as well. And then I run the simulation drawing for each of those, the, so there are four posterior probability distributions, and I draw from each of those and run the simulation 500 times to kind of see what the fit looks like when we run, when we run the simulation based on the parameter estimates that we got. <coughs> So that's the code that will do that will do just this, and we see we're running the simulation from zero to 191 because that's how long our data went for, and that's how long this training topic was. So the results is this is what we get. So it, I think it does a pretty good job. The parameters do a very good job of capturing this dynamic. It nails the peak exactly. So the green lines is 500 different runs. So obviously the Darker ones means that there are more overlapping simulations there, so most of them are covering this sort of path, where it nails the peak and then dies down over time, um, and then treats kind of this just as some noise at the end, um, saying that it dies down closer to 120 seconds, or 120 minutes. Then you see some of the simulation, uh, simulations <coughs> take a slightly different path, where they still get the right peak time, but they have a slightly different um, dynamical structure. <coughs> So those are the simulation results that we get for the hashtag Obama. And then again, to, to be able to compare topics um, among one another, what we want to look at is the infection rate uh, beta and the recovery rate gamma. So this is a plot of our best estimate. Like I said, it was around 0.5 for beta. Uh, our best estimate for the um, beta and gamma parameters. Again, with the uncertainty, um, very incredible intervals. We may all know confidence intervals, but credible intervals are uh, the Bayesian term, which is slightly different interpretation. So basically we're 95 percent sure that the, the parameter is going to be between them. Uh, okay, so I do it again for the other couple topics that I looked at, the walking dead. Same exact methodology, um, but this, I just skip to the results and see how the simulations turned out. Because I like looking at graphs. <laughs> Um, so this one does a very good job of nailing the peak, but I found this one interesting because uh, this one I kind of think about. 
Because this is what happens in 16, like 15 minutes. This is a TV. This happened in a one-hour time like TV show. So people are talking about The Walking Dead, and I guess the show starts, and and or maybe this is mid-show, and people start talking. Then there's a lull in the show, maybe a commercial or something. I don't know. <laughs> but then it, it peaks, but it dies almost. It dies very quickly, as you'll see in the parameter estimates. Um, but like just the show ends, I guess. But the simulation was interesting because a few of the runs picked up this as kind of the peak. But that, so that's probably not the best estimate. Um, but again, mo most of it, um, most of the runs did a very nice job of modeling that. So this is the again the, the beta and gamma uh, estimates. So again, you see the gamma estimate is a lot higher and significantly different from the beta parameter. So this this kind of uh, supports my notion that the show just or the people just stop tweeting about it right when the show ends because the, the recovery rate is almost instantaneous when compared to the uh, infection rate. So this is the last one that I looked at was the Cricket World Cup. So this one again was more on the time scale of the Obama simulation um, in terms of yeah, in terms of time. You get about 500 minutes worth of data, and um, this one was interesting because there this may this one may be one that I would like to look at with a slightly different model because it peaks, but then it kind of peaks again and peaks again and kind of kind of like oscillates off. Um, so that one may take some different uh, different model to to capture that dynamic. Because the SIR, SIR, we're just going to get this peak and then recovery. So these are the parameter estimates for that one. And uh, they're pretty close in terms of how quickly people get infected and how quickly people recover. And they're not significantly different, as you can see by the error bars. Uh, they overlap. OK, so, so now this is the uh, flu epic. Because uh, like I said, uh, these methods are often more often used in modeling infectious diseases. But this is just the scatter plot of I don't know, you may have heard of Google flu trends. They, they basically what they do is they could predict the flu like up to two weeks before it, um, before it happens. So they kind of track the spread of the flu in advance based on what people are searching for, like <coughs> symptoms on the web. So they know before the doctors know, really. Um, but this is weekly data from last flu season, 2013, 2014. And you see this is just the count of ILI cases, so that's influenza-like illness cases per 100,000 in the U.S. Um, Professor Quinn and I, we talked about what that actually was. Uh, I figured it out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's just how many people have influenza-like illness per 100,000 in the U.S. population. And then you can see that grow and peak uh, on December 29th, which makes sense. Um, and this is just in weeks from like, September 1st to uh, April, however long, 35 weeks is that. Um, and it peaks in on December 29th. So this is just the descriptive plot. Now we can do the inferential uh, statistics um, again right here by applying the same simulation, that exact same, but with obviously different priors and um, in terms of the beta gamma parameter. And the initial S is obviously going to be um, higher here because there are more people with the flu than there were in the sample of tweets. So it's just on a different scale. Um, and again, the week. The weeks are, um, so this is 30 weeks while the other ones were like 500 minutes. But it's the same <laughs> that end. So these are the parameter estimates. Uh, in this case, the flu seemed to, people seem to recover a little bit slower than, did, than they um, were infected, but not significantly different because of the error bars uh, overlapping. And you see that the parameter estimates are fairly similar. It's not like a lot higher or a lot smaller because even though it's a um, longer time period, we're modeling it kind of in the same, um, in terms of the same quantities. Like we're doing five weeks instead of five minutes. So, so the parameter estimates are kind of similar in terms of the actual numeric values. And this is probably my favorite plot that I did, um, which I did like last minute. Professor Blaze comes up with this great idea. <laughs> you should do a scatter plot like this. Sure, why not? <laughs> um, so this is just beta versus gamma. Um, so this is, a, I think, the, in my mind, the best way to compare um, the topics among one another. So, um, like I said, on the x-axis, all you have is the beta parameter. On the y is the gamma parameter. So, certainly, if it's above this 45-degree line, the gamma parameter is higher than the beta parameter. Um, so it's a 
very good visual way to look at it um, with a, when you have even more than three topics, this would be a good way to do it. These are, again, just the error bars associated with each one. So the CWC Cricket World Cup seems pretty um, symmetrical in terms of how quickly it, it, it uh, trends and how quickly it uh, recovers. Um, and, and again, we saw the Obama one takes a lot longer to recover. Okay, so now this is also a very fun application of this, is prediction. So, like, and I'm going to continue with this Obama example since we've been going through it. Uh, so, in this case, what I did is I took, so, the Obama simulation, I, I forget, it was a, a few hundred minutes in terms of how long the data I had. So, I took a subset of the data for only 18 minutes before it actually peaks. And see, now let's see if we can fit the model using the same strategies to this data, and predict, and but run the simulation with the parameters over a longer time scale and see how we do uh, in terms of if we can predict the, the path just by a subset of the data. So this, this is what we'll call our training set. We train our model on this and we validate our model on a longer, um, on a larger subset over a longer period of time, which is kind of a data mining or, this is data mining or machine learning terminology, I guess. Um, so again, this is the data that I have. I fit the model to this, it does an almost perfect job of, of capturing this dynamic, but you see the uncertainty significantly increases when we go, to, go beyond the data. Um, so this is a bunch of different runs drawing from the posterior probability distributions, and very tight, and almost no variance in the data that we have, but once we get into the uncharted territory, so to speak, we, the, the simulation um, sees a bunch of different paths as reasonable. And then we can compare this to the data that I actually have, um, and it doesn't do a great job. Um, because, again, the reason for that is because I fit the data before it actually peaked. Um, so it, it doesn't know where it's going to peak. It could peak, um, it could go like this, and peak over there, or it could peak, it, it thinks it's going to peak like right away. But you see that it is in the realm of possibility that some of the simulations do capture this thing very light. But it's certainly in the in the probability, posterior probability distributions that that could happen. So now, um, because I was kind of discouraged with that, um, not having a perfect prediction, I, I did fit it slightly after it peaks, so the model knows where the data peaks. And now let's see how it does after that. This is this is these are the, some of the runs. Again, it, it almost fits that almost perfectly, but and a little tighter in terms of less variance um, afterward. Let's compare that to the actual data, and it almost perfect. Um, so if we know where the peak happens uh, of a training topic, we can almost we pretty we have a pretty good idea of how far it's going to um, or how it's going to end and or die down. Uh, so that was the prediction application um, that I did, uh, which was which is I think there's a lot of room for improvement in, in that regard. But uh, in terms of other uh, potential future work that could be done on this topic. I think it's almost limitless because Twitter's only been around for 10 years. Um, but you can, this, is, this was all done using the SIR model. Like I said, there are other type of uh, compartmental models that can be used. There's the SIS that I mentioned. There's the SI, which is just going between susceptible and infected. There's a SEIR and a bunch of different uh, variations. So perhaps like for the CWC one, perhaps a different model may be better for that data. Because you saw kind of the oscillation toward the end. Um, create better identification or hashtag tools. I kind of picked and, cho picked and chose the, um, the CWC topic, the Obama topic, and the uh, Walking Dead topic, just because they're kind of entertaining <coughs> examples from a bunch of different areas that we could uh, apply to one another. Like I said, I wanted to uh, compare like po political events on Twitter, it's a sports events. So we saw some of that in the presentation, but certainly can't draw conclusions based on just one event. Uh, we'd have to look at more of an aggregate, aggregate view of all the different political topics or the different sports topics and see if there's uh, similarities um, among them. And so, so I did this kind of just by looking, basically visual inspection of what would be good topics to model and interesting topics to model. There, there's probably some way to um, automate that process to find what's a good topic to uh, look at or what's trending. Um, and again, <coughs> the word optimize comes up a lot. We wanna, I want to optimize this project. Um, 
So uh, the window selection was used to create because we had to in order to look at these rates we had to bin we had to bin the tweets the tweet counts over time. So one of them we used a thousand seconds, one nine hundred seconds, and The Walking Dead in such a short period was only number of tweets in the past two hundred seconds. So that again was done kind of by visual inspection. Um, there may be some. There, I know there is a way to optimize that, but it's something that um, I haven't done yet. Uh, more prediction applications, and I think this follows up with yeah, follows up with the next one. Um, to be able to do this in real time, so like we connect to the streaming API, like I, I detailed earlier, and be able to say, oh, this this topic's trending. When's it going to die down? Because I think that would have uh, marketing implications. Some people ask me, what's the purpose of this project? It's cool, and I like looking at, looking at all the charts and the output. <laughs> but, but I think a, a marketer, if they could know how long their, their message is going to last, uh, and predict how long that's going to last, and when it's going to die down, and move on to a different advertising scheme, I think that could be very useful and profitable for them. Uh, so I'd like to have some sort of interactive, even like a web page or something, that could connect to the API in real time, and say, oh, this is what the data looks like, what's going to happen with some absurdity there? Um, so that would be some sort of interactive display. And then there's the stoch stochastic modeling strategies, which I haven't even delved into. This is, this is more looking at rates and different um, transition rates between compartments. But we could treat like each tweet as, um, as, one, as, a, uh, as a tweet, and then it moves on from there with some prob probability. So it would be more of a probabilistic approach, going from you know, tweet to tweet. And uh, that is it. I'd like to thank Professor Blaze, who helped me tremendously in terms of the, uh, especially the computational aspects of this, and Professor Quinn. We still have some work to do reading my paper. <laughs> <laughs> no, you haven't gotten it, so uh, it's, my, it's my day. Oh! <laughs> oh okay. No, I'm saying you're, you're not off the list. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and Professor Zagov is putting on this great event and supporting us uh, throughout the years. Thank you. Yes, it says. <laughs> I don't tweet that often, I just like studying. <laughs> Questions? How did you come up with this topic? Because if, before coming here, I never would have been able to see like, uh, the uh, comparison between the spread of disease to the spread of Twitter hashtags. So, so I, I initially, I was talking to Jake's in the audience. I was talking to Jake one time. We were kind of brainstorming about topics one time. And I wanted to do something, I knew obviously mathematical uh, and quantitative, and I was thinking of like the interplay of like, like, like social and, well, there's this idea of like interplay between uh, social contagion and infectious contagion, like, it, like depending on the group that you hang out with, then um, if they have a disease and you're going to be more prone to disease because you hang out with them, so it's kind of social and infection kind of working together. So that was kind of how I got into this infectious disease thing and, and comparing that to more of a social science application, I guess. Uh, so that, that's that. <coughs> but then I saw Professor Blaze's paper. I just talked to him about this idea kind of uh, generally and I, he, I saw that he applied these models to like zombies. So I'm like, sure I can apply that to Twitter. It's more reasonable, I guess. <laughs> uh, but uh, so yeah. So kind of just started with them. And then once you get the data, you see what you can do with it. And, and then work out pretty well. Other questions? Well, for this audience, I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Great job, Jonathan. Let's give him another hand. Thank you.